Welcome to our Memories of School series of part, as part of the Bowden Education podcast. In these podcasts, we'll be asking people to think back to their school days and the memories, both good and bad, that they have. In this edition of Memories of School, I'm speaking to Dr. Jonathan Barnes. Jonathan has taught throughout Asia and Africa and in primary and secondary schools in England after working as an education officer for English Heritage in the early 1990s, he took over as head of a successful and popular primary school. He became a teacher educator in the early 2000s and was granted a National Teaching Fellowship in 2015. Currently, he is a visiting senior research fellow at Canterbury Christchurch University. Jonathan has written widely on the arts, creativity, curriculum and values in education. In his books on cross-curricular approaches, cross-curricular learning 3 to 14 and applying cross-curricular approaches creatively are used in schools and teacher education courses throughout the country. In 2018, Jonathan founded the charitable company Education for Diversity, dedicated to celebrating the huge creative and social value of our diverse society. Welcome, Jonathan, and thank you for joining us. I, uh, I... And I hope you're ready to go back to school. <laughs> yeah, <I'm laughs> ready. So we're, I'm going to ask you to think back to your school days and to start with any particular memories and it could be primary, secondary, whatever point in your school days. Um, are there any particular memories that stand out for you? I, I, there are so many memories that it's really hard to sort of to 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 to, uh, to itemize them and to, to put them in any sense of priority. But, well, I, just in terms of background, I was uh, I, I was born and brought up in Battersea in London when it was really not a trendy place to live in. It was a it was a slum clearance place, and all, all the streets around me were being sort of bulldozed and, and replaced by the most awful blocks of flats, which are, are, are now being uh, destroyed again. But uh, so I was in I, I was in a very ordinary. Um, sort of working class area. My dad was a factory um, engineer. My mum was a, a cleaner, and um, went to probably the the most amazing school. The, 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 even even now, just just an ordinary primary school. Where this when I'm talking about, I'm talking about from 1956 to 1962. Okay, and in that school, almost all the teachers were rapidly retrained people from the army. They, you know, they'd been in the army in the Second World War. They'd had a very quick, uh, um, I think, two years or eighteen months training, and they were mostly men. So I had a string of four male teachers, all of whom had been. Um, uh, sort of it, sort of senior positions in the army, all of whom were the most incredibly sort of educated and 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 urbane people. One was a poet, one was a, a musician who'd written film scores, one was a, a amateur artist, another one was really keen on on uh, various games, um, and uh, and another was a was a Welsh a Welshman who who was also a, a very keen on poetry. And the, the things that really stood out for me was, was that these enthusiastic, educated people shared their particular passions with us. They were, re I mean, uh, the Welshman, for example, taught us Dylan Thomas. Dylan Thomas was still alive. He'd met Dim Dylan Thomas. He taught us under Milk Wood and we recited uh, bits of it and acted bits, bits out. He also made, got us making a huge Welsh coal mine with all its different layers and train tracks and we made it in the classroom. The same man, Mr. Rochelle, I remember his name, um, got, got us to link up with the, with the captain of a, of a transporter ship that used to transport sugar from the West Indies to Britain and then take British um, stuff over to the West Indies. And we met the captain and the, and the sailors used to write letters to every single child in the class with little bits of 
foreign coins or seashells, all this sort of stuff. So it was re remarkably lively and remarkably practical and passionate. And, and, and we, you know, all of us, I'm, I'm still in contact with some of these people 60 years later, and they, they all remember this, this, this man and this sugar transporter. Yeah, and it, it sounds so idyllic, actually, around, you know, just learning around, all based around children's joy and the teacher's passion. Yeah. But the, the curriculum, uh, of course, in those days. The, well, there, there wasn't a, a curriculum as, as such, and there wasn't a national curriculum, but I, I, it, it was the kind of currentness of it. You know, we were very involved in what was going on right there and then. So it was the time just after the um, just after the Festival of Britain, when Battersea Park, which was very near to my school, had sculpt sculptures by Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth, and we were taken down to see Barbara Hepworth unveil one of her statues. We saw um, Henry Moore um, sort of actually placing a thing on on uh, a, play, a, a, a sculpture which is still there. On the uh, on the north side of the of the Thames, just on the other side of the Thames from the school, we we were seen as part of culture. Our, another teacher, uh, Mr. Maynard, had the the guy who'd written film scores, introduced us to Benjamin Britten's music five years after it was written. It was contemporary contemporary music, and West Side Story. We we learned all the words and all the music of West Side Story when we were nine. You know, and this was so, you know, and that, that's why I'm now, I'm so interested in cross-curricular themes because these, these themes of music and of culture and of, of uh, poetry and art just were part of my own very, I, you know, I felt very privileged and yet it was an ordinary LCC school. It was the time of Windrush. So, you know, a good percentage of the kids were from the, from the West Indies in my class and, my street was more than half West Indian families. And I just loved, loved going into their houses and learning, you know, learning about their, their, their lives and their music as well. And do you think that that interaction, both the, the sort of the cultural elements that teachers bought and mm. no doubt not only from their own backgrounds, they bought cultural elements and stories from their time in the army as well, your army sort of. Yeah, work. yeah. And experiences but also your interaction with the children on your street do you think that yeah. was a catalyst for your own interest in diversity now because you know you champion diversity do you think it started around that age without doubt i'm, I'm in, in no doubt at all about it and and actually that went on i remember i remember i used to i, I love singing and so i used to sing in a church choir and by the time I was, by the time I was like 12, no, 14, I should think, I was asked to lead a little Sunday school group uh, in, 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 the, in the church and all my class were West Indian kids. And so, so I was the only white person in, in, the, in the group. And of course, my best friends were, George was, was a West Indian too. And, and, and so just, just mixing in that, in that street gave me a, a not not just an understanding, but a, an absolute joy of being. With <laughs> they they were much less sort of um, conservative than my parents. So they used to have really loud blue beat music coming out of their houses, and and the and even that same music teacher. I remember taught, he taught us a song. I must have been eight or nine. Carry me a kikoal instead, mark it, but not a quart you could spare. And it was all in kind of West Indian dialect. And I mean, so so he was he was matching what he was teaching us to you know to the to the uh, to to where we were living. <laughs> and I think that to me it sounds just joyous and a real living in the moment kind of curriculum and what you learn, but so impactful. And then you, you fast forward to where we are now. So you could argue we're so much knowledge, more knowledgeable now about curriculum. Things are much more ordered. Um, there are more life chances and, and, you know, obviously technology, but you then look at subjects and you talked about the cross curricular nature of, of the way that the teachers combine subjects. Mm -hmm. but, 
I look now on how we've distilled our curriculum mm. and it's so prescriptive and, and distilled down but my son did geography GCSE and just said it he hated it and yet actually what he thought he was going to get was this um learning around cultures and, and the world and mm. he just felt that it lacked all of that and I think that's such a shame that we're just not embracing children's interests anymore but I think I think I think you're absolutely right and he's he's right to to be disappointed in it I mean going back to the only lady teacher I had Mrs Bettis and she was my teacher when I was seven she was a traveler and she a traveler in the sense that she traveled all over the and she used to give us magic lantern shows of pictures of Venice and of Paris and of, of Prague and Rome and you know we were so thrilled to see these these pictures of these marvelous places I'm, I'm making it sound ideal because it was for me it actually took me out of a very kind of um, constrained um, in a sense quite narrow of family life. Neither of my parents had, had been very educated. They were incredibly supportive of me, but very quickly because of these interests, I, I sort of started learning stuff that they didn't know anything about, like, like travel. Um, but also at that time, there was a, a sense of possibility that, that working class kids like, like us could get professional jobs, could actually better ourselves. And there was a real sense of social mobility. You know, I was, I was even conscious of it. All my friends, you know, wanted to, to do professional type jobs. It was there that I decided I wanted to be a teacher because these teachers were so good. And, that, and I think that, that, that sense of social mobility has kind of, kind of slowed down somewhat through, through my life. And that sense of a curriculum that is meaningful to the child has also been lost by a kind of curriculum that is to do with ticking various boxes and teaching. I mean, I, we learned grammar, we learned maths, we did, we did all, of course, all the things that, all the basics, but the overriding sense was of, of enjoyment of education and being there. They took us on school journeys. I, I saw my first Shakespeare play in, back in the Regent's Park at that, that time in, in the open air. All, you know, all these things were part and parcel of education. And that's not to say it was all perfect. We were sat, for example, in order of our IQ score. You're, you're one of those. Carol Dweck talks about that in one of her talks that she was. She was that happened to her? I, I was furious. My friend Ted got 140 and I only got 115. And so I was in the middle of the class and he was on the front row. You know? And I'm still friends with Ted. It's all right. I've forgiven him. <laughs> <laughs> it was that, you know, it was that. I mean, that was, you know, clearly mistaken. And some kids, of course, were, were, were there for deemed as subnormal, as the word was dull. In those days, the education. I even remember when I took over headship in in Canterbury. I'm now zooming forward to to 1992. There was a book on my bookshelves called "The Education of Dull Children." Can you believe that was that was written written when I was at school? Anyway, yeah. So um, there were bad things, of course. There was corporal punishment. I was. <laughs> I was I was caned for playing you 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 won't believe this Catherine but I was caned for playing judo in the corridor <laughs> <laughs> and I I was I was thrown over someone's shoulder straight into the lap of the head teacher who was very cross with me and uh, and uh, we uh, yeah I got the cane for that and and so on but in fact these these lovely urbane uh, teachers none of, none of them actually did any for punishment as, I, as far as I know that was much more part of my secondary school but that that had gone by the time I was in secondary school I think but it was certainly still around when I was in primary so that was the 80s yeah 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 and I can yeah. remember my head teacher's office and mm. she had a cane and a slipper yes you know, yeah. on display just as a yeah. reminder so oh, yeah no I mean it was very real part of my uh, upbringing and I you know i I, uh, I confess that even as I started teaching, 
in the 70s it was it was still kind of standard yeah. standard and uh, and I in, in fact I had less control when it was standard than than when it was was banned I I, I learned in my first uh, two what no probably first eight years as a teacher that, that that actually discipline was to do with interesting kids and and involving kids and getting the respect of kids it was nothing to do with being frightened and you mentioned about um, the social mobility and how you think that yeah. that's produced. Yet we, I might be wrong, but we talk a lot about social mobility now. Mm. But we, we, you say it sort of deteriorated in in our, our education system. I, I, I think I think it's deteriorated, uh, especially amongst white working class kids. I, I was definitely a white working class kid. All my friends were white working class kids. And those friends that, that I've kept up with have, have all gone from, from that class, if you like, to, to, to being, to having sort of professional um, positions and seeing themselves as middle class. I mean, class is a very odd thing, isn't it? It's, it's really who you who you identify with, but it's to do with with shared values and shared aspirations and and and, and, and shared experiences. But um, I, I was very conscious. For example, again, I'm going back to between when I was seven and when I was thirteen or fourteen. The sense that culture, high culture, you know, sort of classical music or music that had just been written, like you know, like West Side Story is a really strong one for me, and and like modern art and like plays and and poetry, they were part of my life. They weren't posh people's stuff. They were what we did as, as a, a, an ordinary working class school in Battersea. We did those things. We had, we had a, a revolving exhibition of, of modern painters, modern in those days, of painters, which would have included again, Barbara Hepworth and, uh, and, and Henry Moore and the people that designed Coventry Cathedral. We were very much involved in the rebuilding of Coventry Cathedral and that was you know, miles away. We were very conscious of that that sort of act of reparation through culture. Mm. And um, that, I think that's gone. When, when I now introduce those ideas to, to, to children, they, their, their immediate reaction is, oh, that's what posh people do. And, and that was not, absolutely not, what we felt there in Battersea in the 50s and 60s. But what it seems to me is that you were what you were given these these teachers had given you the permission to dream and yeah. i'm not sure we do that now because we've got so much in the curriculum content that children don't go out and about as much they don't get the time to listen to music and and to touch things and use their senses that then enable them to dream mm, yeah and yeah, they're yeah. all kept in our boxes yeah, I, I, I suppose I wouldn't have called it dreaming, really, but in, in a sense, a, a position, a, a sense that the horizons were hot, you know, were, were, were high that I could, I could look out and see. And, and just a little incident, I remember sitting as, a, as an eight, must have been eight or nine, in the front of the school hall, we all sat cross-legged on the floor, I remember the smell of the floor even, and the, every week we had a composer of the week, composer of the week, they had the portrait of the composer and the music teacher ju just played their music every, every week before the head teacher would speak. And I remember sitting, sitting there and the picture of that week happened to be of, of Benjamin Britten sitting on a boat uh, on, a, on a beach um, in, in Aldborough, in, in Suffolk. And that, that image kind of stayed with me right the way until I was 50. And I got the chance to go to, to Aldborough. And, and that, still that picture was there. And why I'm saying that is that it wasn't to do with dreaming. It was to do with, with actually identifying that what was then current culture was actually part of my culture and part of the West Indian kids culture that this wasn't something separated off 
for people who could you know spend a lot of money going to operas or or or, or uh, listening to to music that was very foreign to them but it was it was ours and we learned that this was part of us and so yeah, yeah. John, you've talked a lot about primary school and clearly your experiences of primary school which is lovely yeah. and etched in your mind did yeah. that continue into secondary education I was scared in that secondary. I, I, I mean, I, they had eleven plus in those days, and um, it was the kind of, as it were, the passport to this social mobility. There's no doubt doubt about it. And I, I remember I was the first person in all my family to pass eleven plus. So I went to a grammar school, but I was scared stiff. The teachers all wore gowns. There were two or three really frightening, frightening. One, one teacher was so frightening that I remember doing a maths test in his lesson and I wanted to go to the loo. And I was so scared, I, I just wet myself. And you know, I, and it's just the humiliation of, of that because I did not want to put my hand up and say, oh, it was awful. <laughs> and he, he continued to absolutely scare, scare everybody. It was really awful awful <laughs> and there were two or three teachers like that really horrid really. <laughs> and I think they probably still are and I think we've probably all got our own little memories of those yeah. teachers that petrified yeah. us I've certainly got some yeah. that's for yeah. sure but they're, they're, they're on the same side there were there was a I mean I, I I was sent to that school I chose that school because of its music I was very keen on on music and we had a music teacher. I mean, they, they used to smoke in, in class at that time. And a music teacher that used to spend, spend his time sort of playing us bits of music on the piano with a fag in his mouth. And we, we'd all, we'd, we'd all, we'd all um, sort of have little secret bets as to when the ash would fall. Oh. On, <laughs> on the key. And, but he'd play this stunning, stunning music while he was sort of, I mean, it was just, unbelievable that these things happen but he he trained us to to sing so well that we would sing for two weeks every year in St Paul's Cathedral with with a with an adult choir from St Mark's and St John's Teacher Training College in Chelsea which was very near mm. by and uh, so that was a totally seminal experience for me to have and this is this is really where I see my cross-curricular stuff really um, firming up because I was in like one of the most beautiful buildings in the world with the most beautiful sort of art around me. I remember lining up next to the statue of John Donne the poet, which was the only statue that survived the fire of London. And I, you know, I was told that and I remember touching his feet and thinking how wonderful that was, singing this astonishing music, including very, very modern stuff. And, and, and sort of going through a kind of set of cultural ceremonies that were just you know in my mind beautiful so i'm only 12 years old and i'm having this cross-curricular experience of art and music and light and color and sculpture and and, and architecture all all in one so you know how could you escape <laughs> and, so that's the school too and it, it it's lovely to see how all of these experiences that you've had mm have really informed where your passion still lies now so yeah. many years yeah. later and trying to share the importance and the value of those experiences with teachers therefore to impact young people today I think I well, think you, you spoke about Carol Dweck just now and and, and and Carol Dweck talks about these mental representations of important things that sustain us and that that actually give us a sense of, of resilience too. And you know, it's those moments, the, the school journey to the country place where I saw a, a grass snake for the first time, the, the singing of West Side Story, the, the St Paul's, these are mental representations of good things in my life that have, have kind of always had the, the power to overcome the bad things of, of, of life you know they're like, like everybody you know that lots of, of bad things have happened too but I've got this bank of, of, of good things that happened in my childhood that have been sufficient to 
to keep me steady and to revisit in, in difficult times. And that's why I think schools ought to be doing. They ought to be giving kids a bank of positive experiences. E e even the tiny experience of someone's, you know, someone saying, I like your, like your haircut or, or, or you know, I, I'm, oh, you got new shoes today. Oh, you lost your tooth, what happened? You know, these tiny things mm. matter, they're positive. Yeah, and we do need to focus on that. And all too often, they're just cogs in a machine that sadly, sadly. are judged on their outcomes and their yeah. test scores. And it can be so disruptive and limiting, I think, for a child, if that's what we're boiling things down to. Um, yeah. You know, they'll have their highs and less so with test scores. and But that carves out in their own mind. Mm where they're destined and what they're good at and and to some extent their own value um and that really worries me but nonetheless yeah. i think i think i mean that like i was educated it's, it's really strange when i when i was a kid i used to I, I used to play with my friends in the bomb site and we let's go down the bomb site you see it and and it was really only relatively recently that I realized that that was a bomb site. I just thought it was the place where we played, but that's where a bomb had 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 gone off in the Second World War, which which was only 10 years before, you see. So, so it I hadn't really realized how closely I lived to the war. And why I'm talking about the war is that that after war period generated a sense of let's build a new society let's build something that's fairer that's more equal let's establish the national health let's establish the welfare state let's look after the the poor let's you know and, and you, you had a government that did all those things in in that period after after the war there was a crisis and it was followed by a sense of values coming together to include people even if you read the the, uh, the 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 sort of literature around the festival of Britain in 1951, it's all about everybody being involved in culture, everybody in being involved in in an, in a fairer and more equal society. And I ju I just rather hope that the pandemic has has been the kind of crisis that would generate that in education in particular. And that's that's what I'm writing about at the moment. Yeah, I would agree. And I was thinking exactly the same as you were speaking. Now we've got the we've got a different mm. um, but equally um, important world event, a crisis mm. that should make us stop. Yeah. And think, And let's hope that we do take that opportunity to stop and think. And you're writing about it. So that's fabulous. I speak to heads about that. Let's take a breath and not lose some of the things that we, we're thinking about um, because of the pandemic. And I, I, I do think sometimes these events are sent to us to tell us to, to stop and slow down and take a breath and realign ourselves really with where we were heading. Agree, agree. So you've spoken about lots of inspirational teachers. Is there someone in particular that you look back to and would credit with influencing um, your thinking or indeed how you live your life or a decision that you've made? Is there someone who is key to influencing your future? Mm -hmm. Well, I think as I sort of indicated, it was really a string of key people. Mr. Rochelle taught me this sensitivity to words and to and and to workers. He was very, he, he probably was a socialist. I think you know he talked about coal mines and 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 uh, and uh, and people working on ships and so on. Mr. Maynard was was a, was a a pretty um, brilliant musician and gave me a huge love of, of music, but also a sensitivity to to emotion, he talked a lot about emotion, how in particular arrangements of chords and sounds you could construct emotions of sadness or joy or, 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 or fear. And he, he would talk directly about that. Mr. Mr. Dixon, my art teacher in secondary school, actually painted portraits of, of members of staff 
while we were working as well. So he was working alongside us on his work. He, he showed us that art was not just something you did at school, but something that you lived by and gave you uh, meaning. Mr. Simmons with the, with, the, uh, with the cigarette and the playing just gave me such a, 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 a joy in actually just making music together with, with people. So those, I'd say those are the people that, that kind of stood out for me. I, I, I did RE um, with, with a guy called Reverend Blackburn and he, he gave me a kind of philosophical a, a, approach, a questioning approach to, uh, to spirituality and, 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 to, and to, to religion, a sense that that the answers weren't sort of pat answers that they needed to be questioned and 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 examined and and, and thought about so that yeah that I, I think they'd be they'd be people people that that stood out a jogger fantastic geographer i remember we, i had a scary geographer that used to used to slap people with with a, a slipper if they did the slightest thing wrong but then he was replaced by a young student um fellow that got a job mr cox and he 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 gave me such a fascination in geography by just looking at the streets ar around me and seeing the patterns in the streets of uh, the patterns of land use and the continuing um, the, the, the continuing use of a certain place for a certain function over centuries. I remember he called it inertia. I remember he taught us the word inertia. And um, he gave me such a fascination that I, I, <laughs> that I, I, I went and got a, an A in A level. And when I was applying for, um, for teacher training, my heart was with art. I loved art. I got a place at Christchurch for art. And I, I turned up at Christchurch for art, but my careers teacher phoned me up and said, look, you've got, you've got an A, a um, for geography with such a high mark and you didn't get an A for, for art. Why don't you change to geography? So being the sort of impressionable boy I was, okay, I'll, I'll change. So I, so I changed to geography. And, um, you know, I, 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 love, I love geography, but it, again, it sort of worked with that sort of fusion of subjects I spent a lot of time on top of Welsh mountains drawing the landscape. <laughs> Excellent. So, and last, yeah, there are lots of people. Lots of people rather than one. I couldn't think of that many when I was asked the same question. But if you could change now, last question, if you could change something about your school, just one thing, looking back, what would it be and why? Well, I think it would be that fear element, really. Because, because there were teachers that I genuinely feared. I mean, not just because of their aura, because of the threat of violence and the threat of the the threat of really painful violence. I mean, it was it, it wasn't just some of them were really I'd, I'd say masochistic, really dangerous people. So I think that would be that would be the thing that that I would change you know I, again I you know I said that the the good things would sort of outweigh the bad things for, for me but I know for some children the bad things heavily outweighed the good things and that was mostly these these violent and and at least unkind things that, that were happening at school as well that kind of dismissing of, of, of people in, 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 in terms of things that were really important to them. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, for taking us down your um, memory school lane uh, today. It's fascinating to listen to people's different people's experiences of school mm. in, in different sort of um, Sort of decades and so on and you've clearly had some most amazing experiences and I'm sure those teachers who I expect are probably not in the main with us anymore would look down and think um, how proud they are of you and the work that they were so passionate about that you're continuing so it's just been delightful so thank you so so much Jonathan. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot Catherine.
Thank you.